Welcome back. I know it's been a while since we've done a, a concrete video, but we're trying to get ourselves back on track here. Um, in this particular lesson, we're going to be focusing on columns. This is the start of our column discussion. We've already talked about flexure and looking at singly reinforced and doubly reinforced in the Whitney stress block. And then we went into shear and look at those. But now we're going to switch our gears and look a little bit at um, axial columns. Okay, and there's some, a couple of different considerations that we have to look at. And the design and the analysis of columns is different depending on whether it's a concentric load or whether it's an eccentric load. And then, of course, the type of reinforcing that's in it. And we'll talk about all that um, in this video and in the, in the next couple of videos where we, where we dive into this in a little bit more detail. So without further ado, here we go. All right, so we're going to kind of talk a little bit about the types of columns. Okay, they're classified kind of based on how they're built. Okay, so the definition of a column is a member subjected to compression. Um, usually it's vertical. Um, usually it you know, has some substantial length to it, but not always. So it is a compressive member, okay? Um, but often, other than just compressive forces, it generally has some minimal amount of bending also associated with it. And so a column in a building almost always has a moment or two in different directions at the same time as the axial load. And so we'll be looking at you know things like, is it heavily loaded or lightly loaded? Those were considerations that we had back in the steel class. But in a concrete class, you know, we're going to look at things like, you know, is it a slender column or is it a you know short, stiff column? Or, or there's a lot of little subtle nuances that we need to kind of dive into as we look at this. Okay. Um, for us, we're going to talk about um, kind of the standard, you know, textbook definition of a column um, and that it has to have longitudinal and transverse steel both. Okay. And that the type of reinforcement is what's going to determine the type of the column. All right. So if we kind of look at... Our picture I've got some different different types set up for you um, the first one is what we call a square tied column okay obviously it's a square cross-section now column as with any reinforced concrete shape can be anything right if we have a, the proper set of forms I can make a round column I can make a square column I can make a star shaped column if I want to and they're all kind of handled in, in similar fashions so once you break it down okay but a tied column um, it's called a tied column because if you look, here's a cross section that we have of a square column. This one actually has two different ties on it, okay? And there are rules for how these have to be oriented and certain bars have to be contained uh, differently than other bars and, and that kind of thing. And if um, when we get to those, we'll, those will be, show up in some of our uh, reinforcement detailing uh, videos that will come a little bit later. Um, we'll kind of outline some of these special scenarios that have to happen. And then it's also, if it's in a seismic region, you have to treat it a little bit differently as well. But a tie column, if you look, you see that I've got longitudinal steel indicated by the round circles on this. And then if I look at kind of a, a plan view, or sorry, an elevation view of this, you know, this is that same column, okay? And so here's my longitudinal steel or these lines that are happening here. A tie column is basically, the tie is this line that comes across here. So if you look at this in plan view, you can see that it basically it's a single layer of steel that wraps itself around the, the surface, okay? So it's kind of almost, if you turn this thing sideways and look at it this way, it starts to kind of look like a stirrup in a beam, okay? And so, and they're treated in a similar fashion with one exception in a column you know, in stirrups, you could do kind of a U-shaped thing that looked, you know, something kind of like that, and then you could kind of kind of reinforce it accordingly, you know, put one here, here, and so forth and so on. In a column, it has to be closed, okay? It has to be, it has to start at one point and come all the way around and then come back to that same point at least. I mean, you can wrap multiple times if you want, but it has to be what we call as a closed tie, all right? So that's one of the requirements that we're going to look at. The other, the other type of column that's pretty common, and this is what we call a spiral, and you've heard me talk about these, you know, back when we were talking about stirrup steel on these, but what a spiral is, is it's basically, it's a, normally it occurs in a round column, um, okay, and the spiral itself is a round shape, but instead of coming around back on itself, it actually is one continuous bar that kind of looks like a spring, or we like to use like the old toy, the slinky analogy, right? And so you can see that it starts here, and it comes around, and it wraps around the back, and it's just kind of this continuous bar that goes, goes down the length of it, okay? And so this is what we call is a spirally reinforced column, okay? And again, there's a, a rule for you know, how the reinforcement has to be arranged, 
and you know the maximum spacing adjusts the strength you know and so it's it, it's a little bit different of an animal from these ties or these stirrups that we had um, from before so those are the two most common types without a doubt um, spi spiral columns for the same area of concrete and the same area of steel are usually stronger the spiral does a lot better job of confining confining the the concrete in the core which is this piece inside of the middle of it so that'll be a term you'll hear used a lot the core of it in fact in a column you generally neglect all of this outer covering for strength because once it cracks it generally spalls off or if something hits the column that's the first piece that breaks off it's the central core is where the strength is maintained most of the time okay um, there are some other types though that um, pop up in engineering from time to time um, we're not going to get into these a whole lot, but just so that you know what they are. These are what we call as composite columns. And so I have a rectangular column here, and then inside it is some sort of I-beam or some sort of solid steel chunk that's used as kind of a core. Okay. Um, you can have, um, that's the, 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 the steel core type. You can also have a concrete composite column in which I have, you know, a steel jacket and then a concrete chunk inside of that. Now these show up a little bit more often, especially like in retrofit applications. If you've ever driven by, you know, like a, a bridge that's been repaired, you know, gone under the underneath, sometimes you'll see these metal jackets that are wrapped around the base of a concrete column. A lot of times that's what one of the ways that you come up with these. Now you can design them from the onset, but generally these are typically kind of a repair situation where something has damaged the original column and so they're trying to reinforce it you know with some sort of steel jacket and so um, you call, you'll hear those called the steel jacketed columns but they are also a composite construction now like anything with composite construction and even with reinforcement the, the bond that exists between the concrete and the steel chunk or the steel and the concrete here is very very critical and so a lot of times what you'll see is you have to have some sort of you know some sort of studs or something that are anchoring this thing into the concrete so that it does work as one single unit so so those are kind of some of the types of columns that we'll be that we'll be encountering on this all right now how do you define a column okay so we've already talked about the reinforcing on it okay but there is a dimensional definition that has to happen okay and that's generally what we're looking at is is anytime that you a column is classified when the dimensional ratio is the length to a width dimension is greater than three all right so you can't have this real little short stocky guy and say oh he's a column no it doesn't work that way okay we need something with a little bit of length to it and it has to be a three to one ratio of this okay so the l is the member length and then w is the is the smallest dimension okay so if you have a rectangular shape that looks something like that it's this guy okay if you have a round shape it's actually the diameter Okay, and then that ratio of length to width has to be greater than three, okay, to be classified as a column. If that's the case, then we can get into a discussion of how do we design them and what do we start to do. Okay, all right, so that's kind of our approach. I'll get that off of here real quick. Get our paper cleaned up. Okay, now, the strength calculations that ACI is going to propose are broken down into two categories, all right? For now, we're going to focus mainly on the first one, but I want you aware of the two. And like I said, we'll have a later video on the second one. The first one that we're going to talk about is what we call short columns. Okay, and basically these are the columns in which strength is based solely on the material properties, i.e. that it's, it's not a victim of buckling or some sort of reduced strength kind of thing due to deformation. Okay, a slender column, what happens in that is when I push on the end of it, it wants to experience buckling and it starts to bow. And the smaller this column is, the more it bows. And then the bigger the moment that gets introduced in the middle of this thing as you try to design it okay so that's a slender column and there are a lot of specific rules for how we have to handle this you get into things like you know moment magnification factors and sway factors and all sorts of stuff that you may have seen in our steel class but you know, you'll also start to experience those in slender columns for now we're going to kind of put those on the back burner we're going to say hey it's there but we're not going to design these okay so instead of just being based on the material the concrete and the steel that make it up it's also based on the factor of geometry and moments of inertia or radius of gyration okay so they're a lot more complex to be able to analyze these so we're not going to do anything with this guy for now all right so we're going to focus mainly on the short columns okay so for short columns if i write this here Okay, our basic equation for the material strength of a column is given by something that looks like this. Here's our nominal equation. Okay, and if you look at what this is, okay, let's just draw just a simple little square column. Let's put a couple of bars in this thing, and we'll assume it's got some sort of stirrup wrapped around it. It's a tied column on this. But for a short column, the nominal strength is taken as 0.85 F prime C times AG minus AST. 
Okay, so if you look at that, you know, this is B and this is H. The gross area of this guy is B times H. Okay, the AST is the area of the steel that's in it. So what this is really doing is it's saying we're going to calculate the total area of the concrete and you recognize this piece of it, right? That's that Whitney stress value that we've used. So Whitney will start to play a role as we get into the eccentric column design, but the, the allowable compressive strength of concrete is generally taken as 85%. All right, so I'm taking the, the, the allowable stress of the concrete itself and I'm multiplying it by the area of concrete. Okay, and so that gets me this quantity, AG minus AST. It's everything excluding the longitudinal bars. Now, again, we're not subtracting off the tie dimension. We're only subtracting the longitudinal bars for this capacity, all right? And then to that, we're adding then the strength of the steel. So we're gonna add, you know, that this is 60 KSI and the area of the steel that we had here. That's how you come up with the nominal capacity, axial compressive capacity of a short column, okay? Now, there is one little modification in this formula that has to happen. Once you calculate this term, you have to look at how is this column reinforced. Okay, so like for example, I said that this was a tied column. So if it is a tied column, you have to multiply it by 0 0.8 times phi. And we haven't talked about phi, we'll get to it uh, down below here in a little bit. Okay, but point, it's 80% of phi and then that value. Okay, if it's a spiral column, which was that continuous bar that wrapped around continuously, it's 0 0.85 times phi. Okay, all right, so they've got kind of these secondary reduction that takes place based off and that's because spiral columns generally behave better under compressive loads they do a better job of confining the concrete and you don't have as you know you can have a failure but it's not as pronounced as a of a failure um, when when a tie column goes as when a, a a spiral column goes I mean they do fail but it's um, just it's there's a difference on this okay now the one thing that does change that you know that we have to look at is well where does phi come from okay and so these phi factors those are the resistance factors and as they did before they come out of ACI table 21.2.2 okay and so this was that same table that had the flexure phi values on there okay but for a compression controlled axial case phi has two one of two different values it's 0 0.75 for spirals and it's 0 0.65 for ties so you can see not only are you getting you know less of a reduction on that first term for a spiral, you're also getting a less of a reduction of 0 0.75. So if you kind of account for this, this is 5% greater than that, and this is 10% greater than ties. So it's 0.75 for spirals and 0.65 for ties. That amounts to on the order of somewhere around 10, 15% of the strength more for a spiral column than it is for a tied column. Okay, so, so those are the two little adaptations that we have to make to the nominal capacity of an axial column. All right. Once you've got that figured out, it's pretty easy. Now we get into getting into some of the rules for limiting, and this is where it gets a little crazy. Okay, so we've got to talk about some of the detailing of the reinforcing. Okay, and these are covered in a number of different sections scattered throughout the ACI code. And so what I've done here is I've kind of tried to outline some of the more important properties. All right, so what we'll do is we'll go through the tide columns first, and then we'll come back to the spirals, and then we'll talk about, you know, where all, where all these rules are, find, are found, all right? So for the longitudinal bars, and again, those are the guys that go down the length of the column. This is the cross section, okay? The reinforcement ratio for a tide column is limited to be between 1% and 8%, okay? You're not allowed to go any more than that because, again, we're trying to maintain a ductile failure in the steel, as opposed to a crushing failure in the concrete. So that's what kind of sets these limits. It's the same discussion that we've had back with uh, flexural beams, but now they put a hard limit on row. Okay, now in flexure, back in the day, that's how they kind of prescribed things, is you worked off of a row min and a row max. And so that's what they're doing. This It still survives in the column design. Okay, um, row, if you have bars that are a lap splice, meaning that they are not continuous, and a lap splice, we'll talk about in Detailing is a case where I have two bars and because of length or constructability issues that I kind of construct it and this guy kind of comes down and does that and this one comes here and I don't weld these or mechanically connect them. I just let them kind of lap over each other. If that's the case, then I'm limited to a row less than or equal to 4% of this. So we like to have our longitudinal bars in a column be continuous if we can. Now I can get away from this lap splice scenario by coming in and fusing these by welding or something, but that's extra labor and an extra cost to do it. But if I need the extra steel, that will let me take this 4% back up to 8. 
on those, okay? Um, for a tide column, you need a minimum number of four bars. And what that does is that ensures that when you come put a stirrup on this thing, you know, typically for a rectangular section, that it allows you a place to tie these stirrups off, okay? And then for in the case of a tied column, you would have four corners. That's why there are four bars. But, you know, you could also have, you know, a spiral in which it's doing this, and then I can tie here, I can tie here, I can tie here, I can tie here, that you need the four points for stability to hold all of those things together. Okay, now, if you remember back in Fletcher, we also talked about minimum and maximum areas, okay? When the gross area is more than su uh, sufficient, we can use a, a reduced effective area okay, that is not less than 0 0.5 times the actual area for row. Okay, so if you can prove that your gross area is sufficient for the strength, then I'm allowed to drop these rows by half. Okay, put a token amount of steel. Um, this doesn't pop up a whole lot in my experience in the projects I've worked on, uh, but I do list it there just in case. Maybe if you got into like a footing or a foundation or like a drilled pile or something where it's the concrete area is so massive that the steel isn't really doing a whole lot as far as you know being needed for strength then maybe this would start to pop up okay all right if we look at the, the spiral column again we're, we're going to change my plane here we're going to stick with the longitudinal bars for now just so we can do side by side comparison here's my tide here's my spiral okay the spiral reinforcement ratio is the same the lap splices on the spiral are the same, okay? The spiral column now for the minimum number of bars, instead of being four like we talked about here, has to be six. And that helps to kind of hold, because again, you're kind of doing the spiral thing like that, and you want to be able to kind of, you have to be able to not only hold the bars in place, but you also have to, to set this spacing. And so they say that you need six points to be able to tie that to hold that spacing or that gap, um, what we call the pitch of it um, for that. So the minimum number of bars is six for a spiral column. Okay, and then this reduction is the, is the same. And then over on this side, you can see where all these details are coming from. One's in 10.6, the other's in 10.7, and then 10.3, these are all the details and they're kind of scattered throughout the code that will, will, that will um, happen for this. In fact, this criteria actually comes out of the commentary, not out of the main rules for it. Okay, so, so, so just be mindful of that. Okay. The transverse reinforcement, then, is the ties or the spiral and kind of the, the specifications required for that. So in this column, we'll go through the ties first. Okay, the minimum tie size on this is a number three tie for a number 10 or smaller longitudinal bar. Okay, and if you go to larger than a number two longitudinal bar, then you have to step up to a number four. And part of the reason is, is that when a column fails, Okay, if I have these bars that are happening like this and they're tied with a piece of steel that comes across on this and I end up putting a compressive load, it's like putting a compressive load on this longitudinal bar as well. And if these ties are not strong enough, this bar, without the ties, this bar wants to do something kind of like this. Okay, and it has a lot of stiffness and it wants to buckle outwards and the force that it tries to buckle outwards out with, you know, for these larger bars, larger than, you know, 11 or larger, becomes so big that you need a bigger stirrup to help kind of hold this thing in to keep it from wanting to do this. All right, and so that's why you need the sizes. So it's generally number threes or number fours. Um, number four ties are not uncommon, even on the smaller sizes, but, you know, there is a minimum size that you have to go with. So for number 11, you're not allowed to use number threes. That's one of the detailed provisions for that as well. Okay, um, the spacing requirement, and the spacing is this dimension, okay, between the ties, okay, it's four-thirds of the, the diameter of the aggregate as a clear spacing, so that's from the top to the middle of those kind of things, so for a three-quarter inch aggregate, you have to have a minimum of one inch between them, and again, that's to avoid bridging or aggregates that kind of span over this gap, and then, then you get an air pocket in there, okay, and then the center to center of the spacing, this dimension, for the ties is limit is the smaller of either 16 times the longitudinal bar diameter 48 times the tie bar diameter or the smallest dimension of the column okay and this one's kind of interesting and in that that's that 45 degree rule that we talked about with shear right that the shear depth of a column is going to be related to the reinforcement and the location of that first stirrup at 45 degrees as we start to kind of look at okay and all those provisions will come out of 25.7 including the minimum 25.7.2.2 and 25.7.2.1 so those are some of the requirements for the ties okay the for the spiral column then 
okay? Our minimum spiral size is a number three, okay? And it doesn't have this minimum number four at all in this thing, okay? Because it's assumed that this thing is a continuous bar that's wrapping all the way around, that it's doing a good enough job of confining and we're not gonna get that blowout or that bar is not gonna be as likely to want to bow out. On the, so that is one advantage of a spiral. Spirals are harder to make though, because you've got to get this bar perfectly rounded and then installing it can be a bit of a challenge as well. Okay, um, the clear spacing between the pitches and that's so if I come and I look at something like that, the clear spacing is the inside to inside of that, that's the clear, okay, or the pitch, okay, is the greater of one inch and four thirds of the max aggregate size up to a maximum of three inches. Okay, so to be counted as a spiral, this has to be fairly small. You can't go to like 16 or 18 inches like you can on the tide column that you have over here. Okay, and so that rule comes out of 25.7.3.1. I strongly encourage you, you know, take the time out of the ACI code and go look at these two sections. There are a lot of details that occur all within a couple of pages of this that are useful to kind of file away in the back of your mind as you look at it. So you see we've got some details on 25, and then we get into some reinforcement ratios back up on this upper part that were up in Chapter 10. All of these are very important locations. I'm not sure why they don't try to put stuff together conveniently, but... I mean, it is what it is at this point. Okay, uh, the reinforcement ratio then is going to be uh, of the spiral is basically it has to do with, you know, if this is my spiral bar coming, kind of a reinforcement ratio of the area of the steel. So it's the area of the gross over the area of the core minus one, and then it's the ratio of the concrete strength to the, the spiral tensile strength, and then that has to be greater than 0 0.45. Okay, so there is a minimum reinforcement ratio that's required, and that's kind of a pseudo way of trying to ensure like where we had a big enough bar here, this ensures I have a big enough spiral here. Okay, so, all right. So that's some of the details of the reinforcing. Okay, I know it's a lot going on with you. In the next lesson, we'll actually have a lesson where we'll kind of work at this. But um, let's go in and let's look at some of the additional requirements. All right, and so these all come out of some different locations. Okay, we're back in Chapter 25 again. All right. So the first one states, and I kind of went through and tried to pull out some of the more pertinent or relevant dimensions, and we've talked about this one already, is, is that the rectilinear ties, that means a rectangle tie, okay, must be closed with a standard hook at the end of this thing, all right? So I could do something kind of like this. That's one way of doing it, okay, in which to be able to, to account for the length that I have to have a standard hook, and then I would be counting on strength here, and I would be counting on strength. I guess this would have to come one more over to here or something. But there has to be some overlap, and so to be able to get the strength that you need around that corner, you have to have hooks on both sides to, to account for the tie. The more common version of this, though, is if I take four, and this is the one I kind of told you, is that you do a 45-degree hook here, and you come around, and you come around and do this, and then I come around this last bar, and I do a 45 there. Okay, and then there are dimensions that are required based on the detailings on how far that has to be and what the radius has to be to do that. Okay, so this is probably the more common one. You'll notice that this makes it a little bit challenging to install this thing, right? Because you don't just bend the bar in place, you pre-bend all of these and then you kind of thread that rod, especially this rod here becomes a bit of a challenge. But you thread him in and then you thread the rest in and then you start to kind of slide these stirrups up into place. Um, as you start to try to tie those. Okay, but you have to have what we call as a standard hook. And again, when we get, talk about developmental length in the next couple of videos, you know, after we get done with columns, this will make a little bit more sense. So just kind of file this away um, on those. Okay, uh, the next provision is, is that um, the intermediate support of longitudinal bars. Okay, and this has to do with kind of, and I'll, I've got some graphics down here that will kind of explain this. Okay, the first one is um, every corner and alternate longitudinal bar shall have lateral support provided by the corner of a tie with an included angle of not more than 135 degrees. Okay, so what that's saying is, is that if I have three bars in a row, I have to have at least, you know, uh, of not more than 135 degrees, and then this guy could run past, but then when I get to this one, I have to come back around him. Okay, and again, that's to, to provide... Because if I had, you know, multiple bars and I tried to shoot this all in one straight section, these four center bars, when they buckled, would be able to push that stirrup out. Okay, so this is to help kind of tie all this together. And this, this little requirement is pretty critical to be aware of because that helps you kind of lay out the number of bars. You know, and it, and it can affect, you know, if we come down and kind of look at this guy, 
you know, here I had six bars. It meant that I had to have a corner here, I had to have a corner here, and then this one was okay. But if for some reason you said you needed eight bars, now you've got a real problem on your hands on trying to get this thing laid out, right? So let's try eight according to this rule. It looks something kind of like this, okay? I have to do this, and then every other one has to have a corner on it to, to tie it off. So one stirrup will probably look something like this, okay, or tie, I guess. I keep calling it stirrup. It's what it is, but for tie. And then this one, I, I would start here, and then he would run past this guy, and then I would have to re-enter on him, okay? And so this gets us into the kind of what we call is a double stirrup kind of thing, and that's not uncommon for four bars to have this. In a beam, this means that your AB would be four times instead of two, you know, for if this were the reinforcing of a for shear of a beam. But that's what this critical, what this first rule is saying. Okay, um, let's see. The next rule says then that no unsupported bar shall be farther than six inches clear on each side along the tie from a laterally supported uh, bar. Okay, and so what that's saying is is that. Um, that the distance, so like this guy here that's not supported, okay, that's not being, having this turnaround, I can't go more than six inches from the, his neighbor to get him established, right? And again, they're trying to control that length as they start to look at this, okay? Um, now, if you look at what we've done on some of the reinforcing details on this, there's some different arrangements. Obviously, this one I can accomplish with a standard hook and just wrapping around all those, and I meet the criteria is set forth in A and B. This one, where I have eight bars and three in each face, there's a number of different ways that you can do it, but for this, when you have this arrangement, it's not uncommon to take one stirrup that goes around the outside of the perimeter of the column, and then this guy, I wrap it, you know, by going diagonal to diagonal, okay, and tying it all together that way. Um, this one, we've talked about, um, this is actually, well, this has five bars. We did the four over here. That's the way it would go. A five could be done this way, right? That I wrap this corner, I wrap this corner, that's one stirrup, and then I wrap this corner and this one, which means I have to come around, and you get kind of this double bar kind of happening in the middle, and that's not uncommon to see that happen, okay? And then to prevent this six-inch dimension issue on this, you can take a tie, and I can wrap it around this guy, and then come over to this guy and wrap it around him, and now these two guys are laterally restrained. Okay, but, you know, this guy, I have to be no more than six inches there, okay, in order to be, to meet the detailing requirements. There's a lot of little details like this that kind of come in. Um, the biggest one being about that reentrant corner uh, as being a criteria, okay? All right. So, we'll kind of show you some of the arrangements. I've got a few sketches over here, if I can get over to the next page. Okay, and so you can kind of see some of the details and some sketches that I've pulled. Okay, now, so here's a closed tie. Um, what they've done is they've done a lap splice here. So it starts here, wraps around, comes around, and comes all the way around to that corner. Okay, and then what you want to do as you look at this, though, um, is, you know, kind of a general practice is that you don't want all these splices to be located on the same bar. So I have this one that wraps and splices here. And then if I go to the next one up above that and I come around and do that one also, Okay, then I would want to put this splice over on another corner so that I don't get them all piled up on one bar, you know, so that if that bar fails, it takes the whole column, the whole column out, right? Um, there are some, some rules about cover, you know, for a column. There's an inch and a half. It's kind of your typical cover. You guys have seen that provision before. Um, and then for the vertical bars, uh, the minimum cover is, you know, generally one bar diameter, Okay, and that will go from the inside of the stirrup to the outside. So a couple of different rules for, for that. And you guys have seen that one. Okay, um, let's see what we got here. Um, kind of the same thing. You can, you know, it's optional to come in and put a, a wrap around this, this bar and to do like that. Um, typically, if I can do it in one, um, what happens is that this needs to be greater than six inches. Then I have to come in and I have to wrap and laterally constrain him. Okay, in order to be able to get this dimension to be more than six inches. Okay, and that's kind of the rule of the way that we have to be able to do that. Okay, um, let's see. We go into, we've talked about this one already. This is kind of a splice with some diagonals. Okay, and then another way to accomplish the same thing is I run a tie across here, and I run another tie across here, standard hook. Uh, this is what we call a 90 degree hook. This is what we call a 180. 
Okay, and so there's all sorts of details that you can do. These are generally pretty easy to install because I can slide this around the bottom bar and then I basically just pull this arm up and over here. This is a bit more of a challenge to get lined up. Okay, um, but it's probably a stronger, better design to do it. This is probably easier to build. But it also means that here you bent one bar. Here now I've got to bend two bars and I have to bend it with a 90 on one end and a 180 on the other and I have to be real sure about getting this dimension right to be able to get it in there without causing some other problems in the detailing and the reinforcing, all right? And then you can get into some bigger ones. You know, here's you know, four bars in every face and how would I solve this problem? And you can see that generally it's you know, one here and one here, and that's enough to be able to solve it. But then I also have to watch that reinsurance corner problem that every other bar has to have a corner on it. So then I do this thing. And so this would have four smaller stirrups associated with it just to get that bar to, to for, for a column with 12 bars in it. Okay, um, you can do, um, in this case, as long as you have enough room and tied to developmental length, you are allowed to do just a bar, that kind of a U-shaped kind of hook thing. This is probably the easiest to build on there because I just tie those things in, but you got to make sure that this length is sufficient for uh, the developmental length. And again, we haven't talked about that yet, but that's the case. And then there's a restriction on lap splice minimum distance where these two guys have to be in contact with each other as well. Okay. Um, if you choose to do a 12 bar, what we call a three bar bundle, you can group bundles and then you treat this guy as one bar and you treat this guy as one bar and all the other rules are exactly the same. Okay. And so then it's, it's bundles or singular bars. You know, these guys are obviously less than six inches, but you could treat that as one kind of one bundle in that case. All right. Let's see what else we have. Um, additional spiral requirements. Okay. So the additional spiral requirements come out of the same basic area, 25.7.3.6, and that is that the lap length for a spiral reinforcement is um, the splice length has to be a minimum of 12, 12 inches, or sorry, the, the larger of 12 inches or the greater of any of these, uh, any of these parameters, okay? And it has to do with, you know, and then this comes out of table 25.7.3.6. And what we're talking about on a spiral, on a lap, is if this is my, if this is my spiral, you know, and then every so often what happens is, you know, this guy comes around and there's another one here. At some point it starts to line up and where this guy passes the other one, and that's a horrible picture, that's what we're calling about this lap length. Okay, it's where one bias bar starts and another one begins, okay? Because a lot of times I can't build these out of one bar. They're just, you know, they come in, you know, 40 foot lengths and I wrap it. And if this column is 40 feet tall, you know, I would need multiples of these. And there has to be some overlap that's either wired or welded together. And that's what we're talking about the lap. But I'll leave that, that kind of as a rule for, for um, tallying up for you, okay? So um, it has to do with kind of the coating. And again, this is factors that affect the developmental length. That if it's epoxy coated or uncoated, Okay, and if you're using a plain wire, a plain bar, a deformed wire, or a deformed bar, you can see that there are minimum lap lengths that have to happen that are based on the diameter of the bar that you're trying to establish that strength in. All right, so um, pretty, pretty, uh, hopefully reasonably clear on that. You can see that for uh, deformed bars, you can do, if you do a standard hook on the end of this bar, like you hook it around one of these, I can reduce that, that splice length from 72 bar diameters down to 48 bar diameters. And that can be a pretty significant reduction as well, okay? And so, you know, for epoxy coated and for, you know, uncoated or zinc coated galvanized, those kind of things are some other issues that will happen. Like I say, there's a whole lot that goes into the detailing. I'm just kind of scratching the surface at this point, okay? But at, at this point, we want to talk about the different types of video, uh, uh, columns in this particular video and kind of get your feet wet and be able to kind of calculate the nominal strength. Okay, because the actual strength calculation is very easy. It's just that one formula. Okay, but in the next video, we're actually going to kind of start putting all this to work, and we're going to introduce, you know, well, what does this column do if it's not just axial load? Everything we've done here has been a concentric axial load, no moment. Okay, so we're going to start to kind of dive in a little deeper in the next video, where we'll start talking about the interaction between moment and and axial load. So for now, I hope that's made sense to you. Um, like I say, as always, if you'll leave us some comments down below let us know if you have any questions and we can add additional videos or we can try to hopefully clarify this but you know these are the things that as a designer when i'm looking at designing a column these little details are the most common thoughts in my mind you know because you know you know you know until you get aware of 
what it is that you need to apply. You can't know that that's what you need to apply. All right, so it's a lot of a lot of there's just a lot of loose ends that kind of come out of the detailing of this that you have to kind of be aware of as you lay things out. And so especially the the one about the the, the ties in the reentrant corner and every other bar having to have a corner tied on it, you know, to, wrapped around on it, you know, that kind of starts to dictate, you know, if all of a sudden my reinforcement pattern goes from, you know, six bars to eight bars and my brain's got to be thinking, oh, I've got to redetail this or I'm going to need more stirrups. There's more labor involved with getting those stirrups made on a column. It becomes especially critical on a column. Okay. In fact, it's to the point that, you know, with a lot of those rules, um, some of them can apply for flexure, but a lot of them don't, aren't really relevant in a flexural design. But in a column, it's a totally different thing. And that's because columns are important, right? They kind of hold the building up. So we want to make sure that we're following that. So anyways, um, sorry for that little side. Again, uh, toss us some comments down below and uh, be sure to like the video if you would. And then as always, if you haven't already done it, please subscribe to the channel. That will help us out tremendously. Um, and with that, I will bid you a fond farewell. Have a great evening. Happy engineering.